All right, so we are continuing on in Unit 4 of Jews, Israel, and Jesus. And Unit 4 is Prophets Foretell of Messiah. So we have made our way up to point F, which is Messiah in the Psalms. Now, I've taken a selection of scriptures. You could go through the Psalms and find Messianic references in almost every Psalm. So we're not going to do that. That would be a whole class in and of itself. But I'm trying to highlight some of the key points that focus on who the Messiah is, what he will accomplish, and how Jesus fulfilled these very prophetic scriptures about the person and the work of the Messiah. So we've made our way up to point five, which is just a brief, we're not going to go through all of Psalm 45, but we're going to focus on verses four through seven of Psalm 45. Psalm 45 is known as a wedding psalm. It may have been written for Solomon's wedding. But you can see very clearly that this is also a messianic psalm. This is about something greater than Solomon ever attained to. This is a wedding psalm for the Messiah and his bride. And it also makes clear that the Messiah is God, that the Messiah who will rule in a literal way on earth is God. So let's look. This is Psalm 45, starting with verse 4. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Okay, so this is a wedding psalm for the king and his bride, who is Israel, the people that he has chosen to be his own. Jesus is the bridegroom. He refers to himself as the bridegroom, and also John the Baptist refers to him as the bridegroom. Jesus is identifying himself as the one who is riding out victoriously for the cause of truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. He is the one who is meek. He said, come and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly and humble in heart, and I will give you rest for your soul. So Jesus is the righteous one. He never sinned. He came to fulfill the perfect, just, righteous requirement of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of this majestic king who rides out in victory. Now, the psalmist says, your throne. So the Messiah is the one who sits on the throne, and the Messiah, who is the Son of God, is also being referred to as God. I'm looking at verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So wait, are we talking about the Son, or are we talking about the Father? Yes. God and the Messiah are one. The throne of the Messiah, your throne, O God, meaning that the Messiah is is God. The throne of the Messiah is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom, which is the scepter that was passed through the line of Judah, is the scepter of perfect uprightness. He is the plumb line that Amos prophesied that God was going to send as that perfect measurement of how upright or crooked people are compared to God's perfect standard of righteousness. Well, he loves righteousness and hates wickedness, and this Therefore, now we're looking about halfway through verse 7, it says, Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Wait, okay, so it's saying, therefore, God, your God, meaning you are God and God has anointed you. You are God and God has anointed you. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic King in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness because he lived the perfect life, even under 
unto death. I could go into Philippians 2. He was obedient even unto death. He took on the form of a servant, even though he was God in the flesh. And therefore, God has given him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is God, that Jesus is is the Lord. So Psalm 45 is just making it clear that the Messiah is coming as the bridegroom to marry his people who he has called to himself, but the Messiah also is the Lord. All right, so we're going to move into Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is an affirmation of the Davidic covenant. The one whom God would exalt over all peoples in all the earth was going to come through the seed of David. And Psalm 89 affirms that. Psalm 89 was not written by David. It was written after the days of David. And even in Psalm 89, the people are questioning because the psalm goes on to describe that things are challenging and difficult. And they're saying, wait a second, God, where are you? I thought you made a promise to us that your exalted one was coming to rule and reign in the earth. And so Psalm 89 is an affirmation of the covenant that God has with David, that there is one who is coming, that God will raise up, and that will be the Messiah, the chosen one who will fulfill the purpose of God for his people and for all the nations of the earth. So again, we're just going to take an excerpt from Psalm 89. This is Psalm 89, verses 19 to 29. Of old you have spoken in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. Now remember, we talked in a prior unit about how it's required that the king and also the prophet like Moses must be raised up from the Jewish people. It cannot be from any other people. So this is affirming that I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil, I have anointed him. So this is speaking about David, but we're going to see that it's not just talking about David. It's talking about the seed of David. I have chosen David, but really this psalm begins to speak about the seed of David, who is the one who will be anointed by God to establish the new covenant and bring the whole world into subjection to him. We're at verse 21. So that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. So that's where it starts to get clear because this was written after the days of David's kingship. So why would it be speaking in future tense about David is going to be great? I am going to be with David and establish him. No, David is already gone, but this is speaking about the seed of David. And God is saying, I am going to establish him. My arm will strengthen him. We're talking about a person who has not yet come. We're at verse 22, the enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. So the enemy, remember in the wilderness trials, the enemy, that ancient serpent slithered up to Jesus after 40 days of fasting and he was hungry. And the serpent said, hey, you're hungry. Why don't you turn that stone into bread? Get yourself something to eat. You're God. You have power over all creation. Go ahead and do it. But Jesus did not bow down to the enemy. Jesus was not outwitted by the enemy. And that word there, very interestingly, actually means he was not put into debt by the enemy. He owes the ancient serpent nothing. He was never outwitted. He was never put under obligation or in subjection to anything that that ancient serpent tried to do. That serpent who deceives all the nations was not able to deceive Jesus through his life, through his death. Even the wicked, as they were crucifying him, and it looked like they were humiliating him, Jesus said, my own life, I lay down. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to pick it back up again. He was not humbled by the wicked. The wicked shall not humble him. God raised him from the dead on the third day. He was victorious even over their attempts to humiliate him and crush him completely. But God is the one who will 
crush his foes and all those who set themselves up to hate him. We're at verse 24. My faithfulness and my steadfast love will be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. So Jesus, he says in his final prayer in John 17, he says something to the effect of glorify me so that you may be glorified. See, when you have a right relationship with God, it is safe for God to raise you up and exalt you because you live entirely to exalt him. So in my name shall his horn be exalted. So the exaltation of Jesus only serves to exalt the name of God. It is God's name. It is God's power. Jesus always pointed people to the Father, to God, not to himself, but to God. We're up to verse 25. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God and the rock of my salvation. So Jesus called God his father. That is how he referred to God again and again, repeatedly throughout his entire life on earth. He called God his father. He cried out to God as his father. He cried out to God as his God. And he also, like us, he had to trust God as the rock of his own salvation. Remember, friends, Jesus went to the cross as an act of faith. God was the salvation of Jesus. Or at verse 27, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So Colossians 1.18 makes clear he is the firstborn from the dead. He is preeminent in all things. Jesus was the first to be resurrected and raised from the dead to eternal life. Yes, there are other people in the Old Testament that died and were raised back to new life, but eventually Eventually, they died again. But Jesus, he is the firstborn from the dead. He is the highest above all kings of the earth. We're at verse 28. My steadfast love, I will keep him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. So there it is. The offspring of David would have the eternal kingdom. And those who believe in him, his seed, those who are his followers, those who believe in him, his offspring will be preserved forever. They will have eternal life. His throne will be as the days of the heavens. There will be no end. When God says forever, he means forever. Jesus came and established the new covenant. This is saying, I will make my covenant and it will stand firm with him. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant that is shed for the forgiveness of sins. The new covenant is the covenant that Jesus Christ has attained for us. He is king over all the earth. And through his sacrifice, he poured out his blood and his body was broken so that we who believe in him can have access to God forgiveness of sins in his name through his blood and can live with him forever. He is the firstborn from the dead and at the resurrection, he will have many brothers and sisters who are also born again from the dead to the praise of his glorious grace. Hallelujah. All right, next we're going to take a look at Psalm 72. Now, Psalm 72, it says in the opening line, of Solomon. And sometimes when you see of someone, it means that they wrote the psalm. But the last line of this psalm says, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So I believe that this was a psalm that was written by David as a prayer for Solomon. But David was believing that Solomon was going to be be the one who would establish God's eternal kingdom. See, David had been told by God that he was going to have a son and God would call himself father to that son, that that son would call God his father. And David hoped that Solomon was going to be the fulfillment of the calling of the Messiah in the world at that time. But we already talked about how Solomon failed to fulfill that. But take note that this was David's prayer 
care for his son based on his understanding of what the work of the Messiah entailed. And also it goes into not just on this earth, the work of the Messiah, but the time that will come when the Messiah will rule and reign with perfect righteousness and justice over all the nations and also the abounding fruitfulness and prosperity that will be when Messiah rules in the earth. So let's read through Psalm 72, starting with verse 1 of Solomon. This is David's prayer for Solomon. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. So he's saying, let him judge perfectly. Now, there are other scriptures that were written after the lifetime of David. We talked about this in the last unit, how Isaiah says that he will bring forth justice and righteousness in the earth. Isaiah says in another place, in Isaiah 11, he says that the Spirit of the Lord will be upon God's chosen one, and he will not judge by what his eye sees or what his ear hears, but he will judge with righteousness. And remember, the wisdom that God gave to Solomon, that whole story with the two women and the baby, God gave Solomon the ability to judge with wisdom and righteousness and justice. But he also goes on, we're at verse 3, let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. So remember, what did we say? God's plan for his people was, if you obey me, if you are righteous before me, then I can pour my blessing and prosperity out on you abounding blessing that you can't even contain all of the blessing that I will give to you. So David is praying, let this be. And David is seeing that this is the work of the Messiah, the chosen one who is going to bring all of the earth back into right relationship with God so that all of creation can abound with prosperity for the people as God pours out his love and blessing upon them. We're at verse 4. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. So that's more about the justice and righteousness that the king will bring. May they fear you while the sun endures, and as long as the moon, throughout all generations. So there we go. This is where we're starting to see that David might have been praying this for Solomon, but he's praying an eternal prayer. May the people fear you for eternity, for all generations. This is clearly speaking about the days of Messiah. May he be like rain that falls on mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Do you see that? The rule of the Messiah is for the purpose of establishing the rule of God to the ends of the earth. God's original purpose to bless all nations will come to fruition when the Messiah has dominion over all the ends of the earth. We're at verse 9. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. So there it is, very clear. The Messiah, all the nations will bring tribute to him. The kings and all the peoples will serve him. We're at verse 12, for he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. So this just describes so beautifully the ministry of Jesus when he was here the first time. Yes, he is coming again to bring judgment and justice and violence vengeance upon all those who have not obeyed him or upon all those who have oppressed the needy and abused them. But to him, their blood is precious in his sight. Jesus went to the outcast. He went to the needy. He upheld the widow's cause. He laid down his life for the needy. And friends, that includes you and me. We are the needy. We cannot redeem ourselves 
I don't know what kind of condition you were in before Jesus got a hold of you, but you needed him. Whether you knew it or not, you needed him. You are the weak. You are the needy if you do not have Jesus. But he laid down his life for those who had no helper. He is the helper because our lives are precious in his sight. We're at verse 15. Long may he live. May gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. May there be a abundance of grain in the land. On the tops of the mountains, may it wave. May its fruit be like Lebanon, and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. So it's talking again about the abundance. Imagine creation the way God created it. Even as beautiful as creation is right now today, this is a fallen creation that has been groaning and groaning for thousands of years because this is a far cry from the beauty and the abundance abundance that God originally designed the world and the earth to bring forth. The earth was cursed. The ground was cursed because of the sin of man. And the perpetual sins of man has brought more and more curse upon the earth. The earth is groaning, longing for its day of redemption. But imagine that day of redemption. Imagine the blessing of God. Imagine what creation was like before it was cursed how beautiful, how abundant, how it will multiply after its kind without end. David is seeing that the work of the Messiah will bring that kind of abundance and that the people will flourish and blossom. The people will be blessed. The people will be like the grass of the field, reaching up and basking in the blessing of God. We're up to verse 17. May his name endure forever. Again, eternal name, his fame, continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. So there it is. Abraham in you and David in you, in your seed, all the nations will be blessed. David is repeating that. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. We're at verse 18. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And then again, it says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So this was David's prayer for Solomon, but also for the Messiah, the seed of his that he knew was coming in fulfillment of the promise of God that would restore all the nations to right relationship with him and that God would pour out his righteousness, his blessing and his abundance on all the nations. So this is a picture also of the world to come and what we will experience after judgment has been brought upon this world and all enemies of God. Jesus will usher in the world to come and it will look like Psalm 72. All right, so we're going to look just at some excerpts from Psalms 95 to 100. And these Psalms just affirm that the Lord is king of all creation. But the Messiah, these are also referring to the Messiah and that the Messiah will be God over all creation because he is God over all creation and he will be king over all creation. So Jesus is God. Jesus is is king over all creation, and Jesus will be king over all creation in the world to come. So these psalms are just particularly great for ascribing glory to the Lord, and these also will be fulfilled in the reign of Jesus when he returns to be king over all the earth. So we'll start with Psalm 95 verses 3 through 6. The Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. 
O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. So Jesus is the king and we will be able to kneel down before him. Jesus is the architect of the world. Jesus is the one who designed and created the heavens and the earth, the mountains and the sea. His hands formed all all of us. We kneel down before him. He is our maker. He is God above all gods and above all creation. Psalm 96 verses 7 to 13. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. So again, we're saying all the nations of the earth will worship the Lord. He is the one who deserves all praise. Why? Because he established the world. He is the creator. He is the maker of all things, including you and me. So all the earth and everyone in every nation should be saying the Lord reigns. The God of Israel reigns. We're at verse 11. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. So yes, he is coming. All of creation gives glory to God. All of creation knows that the Lord is God. That bird, when you wake up and you hear a bird singing every morning or every evening, that bird is giving praise unto God. Sometimes the birds are smarter than we are. The birds know who made them. The birds are giving all glory and exaltation to Jesus as Lord. They are praising him. The sea is roaring. The earth is rejoicing. Rejoicing. The heavens are glad. The fields are exulting. The trees clap their hands. Did you ever think of the trees as having hands? Well, they're branches. You know, when the wind blows through and the branches kind of rustle about, the trees are clapping their hands and giving glory to Jesus because Jesus is coming to judge the world in righteousness and in faithfulness. He is the king who has the scepter of authority that would not depart from Judah and the descendant of David. David, who would be king, the firstborn from the dead, king over all the earth with an eternal kingdom. We're up to verse 97, verses 1 through 7. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. So you see, all of creation knows that God is the God of all the earth. The mountains melt like wax. The mountains, as strong and majestic as they may be, are nothing compared to the glory and the strength of God. All of creation has been groaning to be redeemed. And when the Lord comes, even though this earth will be rolled up. This earth will be switched out like a garment and the new heavens and the new earth will be brought. All of creation is excited for that day. We're up to verse six. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. So the Messiah to come, he is bringing judgment all of creation is waiting for the one who created them. All of creation awaits the one who is to come. All peoples everywhere will see the glory of the Lord as the lightning flashes from the east to the west. So it will be on the day of the Son of Man. 
all creation and every human being will know that Jesus is Lord. And I say that pretty often. You know, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. On the day that he comes, it's going to go one of two ways for you. Either you, with all creation, will be rejoicing and saying, Yay, Jesus is Lord, and I've waited for him. Yes, Jesus is Lord, and I have put my faith in him. Hallelujah. Bring on the world to come. Amen. Or you will be saying, oh, no, Jesus is Lord, and I made the wrong decision. So, friend, today, if you have not put your faith in Jesus, today is your day. Put your faith in him and follow him. Give your heart to Jesus and let him give you a new heart, a heart that loves God and honors him and serves him and worships him and follows Jesus by obeying his teachings and commandments. Because what this just said is that all those who worship other gods will be put to shame. So it says, worship him. Jesus is the one who is coming to judge the earth and bring in the world to come. We're up to Psalm 98 verses 3 through 6. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with the trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. So the King is the Lord. The righteous king who will rule and reign from Jerusalem is Jesus, and he is the Lord. All of the ends of the earth know it. All of creation recognizes him. All of the earth breaks forth into singing. So we also should pick up our instruments and give him praise for who he is and all he has done. We're at verse 99, verses 1 through 5. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. So you see there, see the cross reference with Psalm 72? He is bringing perfect justice, perfect righteousness. He loves justice. He loves righteousness, and he establishes it in the earth. It goes on. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. So again, this is calling all people. What is the message of the proclamation of the gospel? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. Tremble before him. He is exalted. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. He loves justice. And your blood, your life is precious in his sight. He laid down his life for you. And now God has exalted him to the right hand of the Father with all authority to rule and reign over all the earth. Let us tremble before him and worship at his footstool because he is holy. Hallelujah. And then lastly, Psalm 100 verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now that also is the psalm where it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. But this is just highlighting that the Lord, he is God. He is the one who made us. We are his people. We give all praise and glory and honor to him. Jesus is the fulfillment of every messianic psalm and he also will be the fulfillment fulfillment of every song of praise from all creation and all who truly worship the God of Israel, the one who created all things, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, who will rule the earth with an eternal kingdom forever and ever. Mm -hmm.